came. As, as academics, we're very fortunate to experience one of the under-recognized but very important kinds of human relations, which are the relations between teachers and students. And the, the next session is going to focus on, on that. Uh, Ken, of course, had very many students, all of whom became very distinguished. We've already heard today from, from Roger Meyerson and Eric Maskin and, and Jim Mirleys. And, uh, and at lunch, Dan McFadden made a claim, which, which we may hear more about later. Um, but, but our first speaker on behalf of students today is Ross Starr, who got his uh, PhD under Ken's supervision in 1972 here at Stanford. Ah, good afternoon. Uh, Nancy has pointed out that she and I are appearing both in alphabetical and chronological order. Uh, she was Ken's student during the 1970s. I was a student during the 1960s, though, as uh, Al pointed out, I didn't quite finish until the early 1970s. Uh, my professional life was decisively formed by my study with Ken Arrow. I first met Ken, then of course he was Professor Arrow, in 1965. That's a lifetime ago. As an undergraduate at Stanford, I enrolled in Ken's graduate level mathematical economic theory course. Of course, that was completely inappropriate. I had taken none of the required co uh, courses to, uh, to fulfill that. Uh, but, uh, but Ken didn't say no. He assigned me a daunting reading list as preparation. That course was a view into another world where the precision of mathematics had a compass limited only by the scope of imagination. Uh, the focus of the course was arrow de Bruyne general equilibrium theory, uh, taught basically from the working manuscript of uh, Arrow and Hahn's general competitive analysis. As Ken lectured, some of the uh, ink on some of the pages was still wet. The course required a term paper in those days before the internet, Ken had immense files of hard copy of all of the latest pre-publication uh, documents of papers that were eventually going to be published. So he gave me a s intelligent selection pile of quite modest size uh, to read in preparation for the term paper. And uh, on draft of the term paper, I got comments uh, by correspondence, by long correspondence, from Robert Alman in Jerusalem. And then Lloyd Shapley and his colleague, colleague John Folkman put together mathematical tools that turned out to be very helpful in developing the results of the paper. Well, that term paper became my first publication, quasi-equilibria in markets with non-convex preferences in Econometrica. Well, after a start like that, there was no turning back. Uh, from that beginning, uh, uh, in that fall quarter, Ken permanently set the course of my career. Ken described economics at Stanford in the 1960s this way. It appears to be a golden age. Our group of faculty and students in economic theory at Sarah House had an informality and collegiality. We felt ourselves a community, not an oppressed minority, but a vanguard. We were taking over. On summer Fridays, wine and cheese parties at Sarah House reinforced the esprit de corps. And there was a bi-weekly joint Berkeley-Stanford mathematical economics seminar meeting alternately at the two campuses. Uh, that was a lively setting, including Arrow, De Bruyne, Kurtz, McFadden, Radner, Uzawa, and visiting colleagues. When Ken moved to Harvard, several of us followed. On the faculty were David Starrett and Masahiko Aoki. Trailing graduate students were Louis Gevers, Walter P. Heller, and myself. Ken spent summers back at Stanford at, I'm not sure whether it was IMSSS or SITE, uh, but in any case, those were intense multi-week sessions devoted primarily to economic theory with visitors from around the world. Now, Ken was a great hero to all his students. So all of his attributes became legendary. We marveled at his presence in seminar. A colleague comments this way, way. Kenneth would regularly doze off. He would wake up, 
and, remarkably, make incredibly incisive comments. I sometimes wonder whether he could sleep, listen, and process information all at the same time. Ken has commented that he did not consider himself a great teacher. And there was a legendary failure. Of course, as Bob has said, it's not consistent with a great mind to have a completely ordinary failure. It needs to be a great failure. In the late 1960s, Ken taught a lower division principles of economics course at Stanford. The TAs discovered that the lectures went way above the heads and comprehension of the undergraduates there. The students were so bewildered that their exams were an embarrassment. The TA said they worked hard to keep Ken from finding out how badly the students had done. But eventually he figured it out and was keenly disappointed. And there were great successes. At Harvard, Ken taught an amazing graduate course. The focus was the theory of social choice. The room was packed with graduate students and colleagues. The professors were the three greatest researchers in the field. The philosopher John Rawls, who authored A Theory of Justice. Amartya Sen, who may still be in the room. Uh, and Ken Arrow. It was amazing. And in the 1980s, Ken taught a popular Stanford graduate course on the history of economic thought, offering the keenest of insights. The room was crowded with eager students and auditors. And has been noted, Ken's uh, uh, success as a teacher includes uh, four Nobel Prize winners. So he's doing okay. Despite his brilliance and achievements, as has been noted, Ken was totally unpretentious. Our colleague, Richard Zeckhauser. Richard, are you in the room? Right there. Our colleague, Richard Zeckhauser, remarks, one of the most remarkable features of Kenneth, with colleagues, students, and others, was that he did not recognize that he just knew more and saw more clearly than the rest of us. That he possessed not one sliver of excess pride or arrogance was one of his most endearing qualities. Another quality that, uh, that's been commented on in the past that Bob mentioned at Heracles was his enthusiasm, the vigor with which he spoke. So there you see him gesturing, uh, smiling at the same time, uh, looking out. That's Ken. That enthusiasm was infectious. He gave it to all of his students. We all uh, became enthusiastic uh, uh, as, a, uh, uh, as a consequence. Now, little known fact, Ken was so unassuming that most of us do not realize that he was a very highly regarded, successful football coach. The Little Big Game is played annually by economics graduate student teams from Berkeley and Stanford. At the inaugural game, the teams had honorary coaches. The obvious choice, Gerard Debra and Kenneth Arrow. And just like the Stanford Axe, the little big game has a trophy that moves to the winners. Uh, the game trophy, known as the Arrow de Brook Corps, is a brass Edgeworth box with kind of a chewed up apple core at the center. And there have been wonderful celebrations. On the 65th birthday in August 1986, an immense birthday conference and party took place at Stanford. It reunited colleagues and students from around the world. There were two days of conference papers and testimonial remarks and a three-volume festrift. Well, one birthday party isn't enough. Everyone has uh, one birthday a year. On the 70th birthday, the celebration was at the doctoral alma mater, Columbia, with another festrift. And on the 70th birthday, the Stanford uh, Arrow Lecture Series was initiated annually inviting leading researchers to speak at Stanford. Well, it wasn't a birthday for Ken, but the 40th anniversary of mathematical general equilibrium theory was celebrated at CORE in Belgium in 1993. And the leaders of the celebration were the 20th century founders of the field, Kenneth Arrow, Gerard de Brugge, and Lionel McKenzie. And there was a happy coincidence Round birthdays are important. 
the 50th anniversary of social choice and individual values, and Ken's 80th birthday coincided in year 2001. The conclusion of that celebration sent the audience singing into the evening. There was a special ad hoc musical group known as the Economy Singers. They sang their advice to rising young economists. Brush up your arrow. Start quoting him now. So here we are again. It's a little more than 15 years after that celebration. And uh, the advice is the same. Brush up your arrow. Start quoting him now. Ross already started to tell us about the transition to Harvard, and Nancy Stokey is a student from the Harvard years. She got her PhD under Kent supervision in 1978. Okay, so this morning we've heard and we'll hear more this afternoon about you know, Ken's tremendous accomplishments as you know, one of the giants of the profession. Um, but I'll, I'll claim actually he was, he, was a, he was a very, very good teacher. And I think a, a lot of the things that made him a good teacher also made him a, a valuable uh, member of the profession in ways, you know, above and beyond, you know, just what he wrote, his, his research. Um, so I feel like, I, I feel I was, I was uh, it was tremendous good fortune to be his, his student and I'll try and explain why. So I think there were several traits that made him um, very special as a teacher. And first, as, as a lot of people have remarked already, um, it was his, partly just his vision for economics as a social science, as a science that dealt with human behavior and could answer important questions that were important for all of human society not just you know, uh, a narrow thing that would get published in a journal. And I think that was, um, you know, students sensed that and, and that, that made his lectures more interesting. So although he's you know, most famous in the profession as a mathematical theorist, as a pioneer in general equilibrium theory and social choice, it was always clear that his motivation for the mathematical tools was thinking about human questions. And it's easy to see this, you know, if you look at his collected works, you know, it's on the shelf, it's long, but there are, there are papers about, you know, health insurance, about the role of higher education, about how risk uh, affects individual decisions, how information or the lack of it affects markets, and many, many more. So the, lots, lots of work about, you know, I would say what we would call applied and even and policy questions. Um, so the, the tremendous, you know, breadth of interest came across in his classes, and I would say for students, you know, this was this was marvelous. So part of it was just, you know, as a as a first or second year graduate student, you know, we hadn't read anything or even thought very much about most of these topics. And it just, uh, it was just inspiring to hear about all these uses for economics. Um, so I think one of his greatest, you know, assets as a teacher was just his enthusiasm for his subject and his belief in the power of economics, you know, to make the world a better place. So, uh, during my period as a student, he taught a, he taught a, he taught the, the uh, you know, half of the basic micro course in the first year. And, you know, maybe I'll agree with his undergraduates, like if you want to learn about the Slutsky equations, you know, that might not have been the best place to do it, but he had great TAs, so that was fine. And then, you know, during the second year, he taught a course on information economics. And that was kind of a you know, fairly new and blossoming area of economics at that time. And it was also a springboard for thinking about a wide variety of questions. And you know, when, when Ken Arrow came to class, he always had, you know, he'd prepared, he had lecture notes. But what I remember is some of the best times in class were when he got off script 
you know, maybe it was from a, you know, a question from a student, maybe it was just something that occurred to him on the spur of the moment. And then there'd be, and then he'd just talk extemporaneously about, you know, a wide variety, you know, a, a, a bunch of subjects. And he would jump from one to the other and just, you know, oh, well, this reminds me of that, and then that makes me think of the other thing and the other. And, you know, the, when you're listening to this, you could always see the connections. Um, but then they weren't connections that you would, that I would have seen on my own, you know, without, uh, without a guide. So, you know, listening to those lectures, to me it was like, you know, watching a mountain goat just jump from peak to peak. And, you know, it was, uh, it was marvelous. So a second trait that made Ken especially valuable was, as other people have said, just his generosity with his time. So, you know, as a, for a student at Harvard, it was never hard to make an appointment to see him. There are other faculty members that it was much harder to, you know, even get on a list. He rarely, if ever, canceled an appointment. And, you know, once you were in his office and talking with him, you know, I never felt that, there, you know, time was being rationed. It was like we could go on until, you know, we'd kind of reached the end of our discussion about a subject. And in these conversations, I always had the feeling, you know, he, with, you know, me as a, you know, this was early in my graduate career, it, it was, he, he treated everyone as equals. And that was, I think, just a marvelous thing. Um, just willing to listen to, uh, you know, anyone's reasoning, you know, follow, follow it, you know, disagree, point out flaws, but always with tremendous respect. And I would say, like, maybe for me as a, you know, young woman, especially at that time, there weren't so many women in economics. And, you know, uh, I would say, you know, harassment and discrimination a little bit, but like not, that was not a problem. But there was, I think, at that time, and maybe even still, a problem as a woman especially being ignored and not listened to, not taken seriously. And so it was, you know, quite wonderful to be taken seriously. And, you know, so it wasn't just me. He, he treated everyone that way. Okay, and this leads kind of to the third thing that I think made Ken very special as a teacher and, and also to the, to the profession as a whole. And, and that really was like just the respect that he showed to everyone. And it was, I would say, probably most evident in seminars. You know, I mean, Ken was quick and sharp and he didn't, you know, he didn't tolerate errors or fuzzy thinking. But he, in seminars, he showed by example that attacking or criticizing an argument didn't require attacking or criticizing the author. So he seemed to view everyone in the same room as being, everyone in the room as being on the same side of an argument. And that side was trying to answer the question that had been posed. And so, you know, trying to see if, you know, how the answer being put on the blackboard, you know, how that held up, whether there was possibly an even better answer to be had, or probing even farther to see if there was a better question to be asked. Um, but we were, all in, we were all in the seminar room to attack the question, not to attack each other. So I think this civility, you know, in the seminar room and outside as well, you know, I saw that especially um, during, I came out to Stanford for a couple of summers that I remembered as the IMSSS Institute meetings here at Stanford. And I think part of what made that research environment so stimulating and so productive was, and not just for me, but for, you know, the much more senior people who were kind of the center of that group was the, the the freedom to, to talk and argue and possibly even to make mistakes. So I think intellectual argument is often more fruitful when there's, um, the participants have enough respect and trust for each other that they can debate freely and not be worried that a, um, a flawed argument will brand the, uh, the author of that argument as flawed. So, you know, sitting in the coffee room in, in Cena Hall and just 
you know, overhearing these discussions and conversations, that, you know, all by itself was a, was a great uh, education. So the organizers of this conference found a wonderful quote from Ken, and I'll, I'll read it. So, knowledge is a free good. The biggest cost in its transmission is not in the production or the distribution of knowledge, but in its assimilation. So this is something that all teachers know. Well, I'm not sure that all teachers actually do know that, but it's, it's exactly right. Um, you know, the great, and I think the great teacher is the one who inspires his students. So assimilation of knowledge is hard. Um, so life as a PhD candidate or any other kind of student means a lot of hard work, um, many hours with no guarantee of you know, what's gonna come out. So it's critical if you're going to put in all that hard work to believe that the work is valuable, the questions are important, and that it's possible, at least sometimes, to answer them. And Ken Arrow was a great inspiration.